different circumstances, you know, it's, uh, yeah. So anyway, there's just a lot of really cool community-based initiatives that occupational therapists could really work in and really just have a great impact in with people in the housing environment, all kinds of, you know, supported work everywhere, but there's no way to bill for our services and some of these non-medical, um, yeah, things. So, yeah, it's uh, it'll be a it'll be a three to four year project, you know. But they're they're just at the beginning now of um, shopping it around to other professions and stakeholders and working with NAMI, who's you know really interested in in supporting us. But we're nowhere near you know working getting a sponsor or writing a bill or anything like that. You. You can't really do that, as you know, Aaron, until you can really have evidence that you're not going to cause a big fight <laughs> behind right. it. Everybody sure. wants to know that. Are they cool with this? Are they cool with that? <laughs> you know, before they even consider, you know, drafting something. So we're in the very, very preliminary stages. Is there anything PHAC could do to help it this at this stage or not really it's just kind of not so quite prominent. yet i think once we start the next stage of i've been thinking about you and i've been thinking about this group you know and when would it be appropriate but i think that's sort of the next stage that's coming right now is just the student and this and these professionals in the state it wasn't just a doctoral student but she was took the charge of it and then um the person who directs all of rehab services in the state mental health who happens to be an occupational therapist was part of this committee and a bunch of other people. So now it, um, as soon as we get to the next step, once this legislative season is over, our government affairs committee is going to take it up. And um, then I will know once we get to the point where we're asking for people's opinions about it, I would, I would bring it to the public health advisory committee um, at that point. And Terri Ann, um, I know I jumped in. Oh, look at that. Like a transcript is being written. Wow. That's crazy. I didn't even know that. Um, my question was how you started your couple of sentences. Is that this is an action that's happening at the state level? Um, no, Aaron, well, something we had talked about before is I had just yes. mentioned that my profession, which is grounded in mental health, and it has a great presence in mental health practice in this state is sort of locked out of doing things in settings where we're yes. most needed because of the wording of who can be a qualified mental health provider yes. in some of these settings. And that's the language that we're, we're trying to um, amend, I guess, amend or addend. So, Maybe that would be the word. <laughs> yeah. Within your profession, it's within but the state. also it's at the, the state. state level. It's really the state. It's not the <clears throat> yeah, profession. That's what I it's at the state. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's just that that conversation is actually happening in many different ways. Think, yes. Yes. Yeah, I think we're just on the fringes from our own profession's perspective. I think there is a lot of conversation happening to answer this crisis of we mm -hmm. don't have enough people to support the needs of this population. Right. <sighs> because I work in the um, with the Community Health Improvement Partnership of Hennepin County. Uh, this has come up in the Community Mental Wellbeing Action Team is that, uh, you know, complexities of providing mental health services for youth mm -hmm. is also a big problem uh, because you have consent forms. You also have um, uh, yeah, a lack of uh, mental health providers, you know, that work well you know with youth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. culturally competent culturally inclusive you know mental yeah. health providers yeah so it's it th this conversation is happening in many circles and even in the schools you know a, a third of my profession works in the public schools and the other thing that's happening in our profession is starting conversations of caseloads because really therapists who work, occupational therapists who work in the public schools should should really be addressing anything a student needs to be successful mm -hmm. in that occupation of being a student. And if it's primarily behavioral health, well then, you know, there are some sensory connections to some of that, but a lot of that's trauma-based and, and other things. And there, some of these therapists are working in districts where they have 300 kids on their caseload, you know, and they're not they're seeing these kids, you know, in a more of a consultative thing, talking with the teacher in the classroom 10 minutes a week. 
Right. You know, you, you know, the tricky thing, if I, you know, as you move into later phases, one comment that I would make is, you know, the, the conventional wisdom is that, you know, mental health is never going to get fixed because there's no money in it. Right? right. Like, so, you know, I always kick around in my head, well, like how much money are we spending on policing on responding to, to drug overdoses? You know, if we can, if you can somehow quantify all that and highlight that so much as, mm-hmm. um, you know, I mean, I try to be an empathetic person and I, you know, I want people to live their best life and can be in, you know, have a live in a society where people are cared for and ty- that type of thing, like a good liberal would. But, you know, for many people, it comes down, especially policymakers, it just comes mm-hmm. down to dollars and cents. Yep. And if you, and if we can somehow get some of that data that shows, you know, how, what does it cost to have untreated mental illness running mm-hmm. through the city? You know, that's that you maybe yeah. can just bring in another sector of people into you, into you. I agree the 100%. Mm-hmm. I think the other thing that, uh, cause I, I sat on the, um, uh, community advisory committee for intellectual and developmental disabilities in Ramsey County for 10 years and uh, because that's where my background was working Mm -hmm. and with people with IDD and uh, part of the argument that we often made is that having to reframe the argument about providing those services is exactly that. These are your future taxpayers. These are your future voters. These are your future decision makers. These are your future you know, whatever, fill in the blank. And what money would you not want to dedicate to making these individuals the best possible civic-minded, you know, able-minded um, folks, you know, to be able to fulfill mm-hmm. those roles? Because we're all going to pass on and yeah. we need a future workforce. We need a future decision making force that is going to have capability. So, you know, yes, it's interesting that's Mark, that return on investment. That, but it taps into this huge divide that is going on in this country right now is who is worthy of investing in and who is not, right? And um, there are, are people who already think they have in their head who it's worth putting, you know, these resources and others who there's, you know, I don't necessarily want these people to be these people, air quotes for the transcript, um, you know, to be informed, educated, empowered. I mean, you know, there's, there's a, it's just such an interesting time. It's to, to make these appeals, which seem really rational about, yes, don't you want the people coming after you? But it's sort of like we have policymakers entrenched in the, I'm going to keep the grips on you from the grave of yeah. how I want things to go down in this country, you know? Mm-hmm. And we're feeling it right now, I think, right? <laughs> With a lot of the changes that, not progressive changes, but regressive changes that are happening in a lot of areas. I don't mean to be a buzzkill to that. <laughs> <laughs> I read no, the I news, it's not- absolutely that... true, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's, it's happening every day. I mean, you see that when, um, you know, even people, you know, the, the like guns, for example, I mean, the majority of the population is uh, in favor of reasonable gun control and universal yeah. background checks. And, you know, you have kids in a school in Florida get shot and they can't pass gun reform. So, you know, that's yeah. and that's why I made that's why when it comes to health policy i mean i you know I, I work in banking but i have a degree in in healthcare law and policy and you know, i've been talking to people about that for 10 years you know just in the public and i've really just come to believe that that if you don't put it in terms of dollars and cents people don't care and mm-hmm. that it sounds it sounds terrible but you know really um if you can if you can show you know the the people who are so against the affordable care mandate for example it's like well actually that that flattens the cost curve because you have more people that Mm -hmm. you can keep 
the statistics on and you can engage in better uh, planning across the society. So it's it's actually cheaper rather than having those people have, uh, you know, unreimbursed care, which is then the cost is shifted to the people with insurance anyway. Yeah, it's almost like if everybody could get, you know, a yearly summary of, hey, this is what your premium would have been this year without the Affordable Care Act with the same number yes. of people getting the same services unreimbursed. Yes. And like the what's in it for you angle. I agree, Aaron, like this cut and dry, like, hey, you know, I mean, some people would still not be happy with that or they maybe they would question the validity of that data. But, you know, it would be an attempt. You're right to quantify things and impact on you, you know. Um, yeah. Well, and you, and you can't please it. I had a, I had someone call me today, said he was returning the call. I said, I didn't call you. And then he got <laughs> he got mad. Good. Yeah, he got mad at me and told told me to to never call there again. And it's like, dude, you're the one you're the one bothering me at work. I got stuff to do. So, mm -hmm. you know, some of those people you just can't you can't please everyone. But even if you can think in terms of taxes, right? I mean, we all live in Minneapolis. You know, we have high property taxes. Um, you know, depending on where you are in the city, I know there's lots of variables, but really when I compare myself to, you know, friends of mine that have comparable types of houses in comparable neighborhoods in like the suburbs, you know, our taxes are really different. But then I think, well, I get a lot of things in Minneapolis that, that I really value. But if you had a way to even show like how much of your taxes are going to X, Y, or Z, things that are, that really drain, like, and what would that mean if instead of having to send police officers out all the time on crisis calls, we could actually send trained social workers, right? Like what would, what would that do to the trajectory of our taxes in Minneapolis? If we just better spent the money we're already taking in instead of having to constantly come back for more, right? Or have our libraries are only open three days a week now because there's not enough money for that, but we're spending it right. all over here, you know? Yeah, that's that's the trick. I mean, even, you know, I used to work at 800 Nicolet, which is right by that target there. And there was, um, you know, I was on the fourth floor, so I could hear, I mean, there was an overdose or um, we assumed it was an overdose every single day because it was almost... I mean, you could almost set your 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 watch by it, like early afternoon, and just having um, police responding to people who are in mental health crisis or or mm -hmm. drug overdoses. It, one, it's not good care, and two, it's not cost effective. Right. I don't know. I don't know the answer. You just got, you can't you can't get it into. I mean, if you can find a way to get that into people's heads, and I and I I just think that um, I you know become sort of jaded over time and think, okay, well, you can't force people to have empathy, but if you can at least do the you know the dollars and cents and show it show it to them, and then mm -hmm. if they're still against it, then you know then what do you do? So, mm -hmm. Twee, I'd be interested in hearing just you know sort of what are some of your thoughts, you know, especially. Again, as a student, you know, at the University of Minnesota, I mean, these also have to be critical conversations that are happening there. Yeah, um, I'm just been sitting absorbing. I really enjoy this conversation because um, I was looking through the list of like the main themes for this group. And one of those that I I picked up on was, OK, I really want to talk about, you know, the lack of um, healthcare providers, mental health care providers, and like what can be done about it. I had no idea that there was this group that are very, you know, that is capable of providing such services that are being kind of boxed out of that. And I think that's, that's great. And we really I kind of really want to do so. I know you said that like, there's not really room for us right now, but I'm really excited about that once that becomes available. Um, I think that, like Aaron said, like, you can't make people <laughs> um, be empathetic. I think that I think public health communication needs just to be improved, you know, and I think that's kind of the theme that we're talking about now is like showing people these numbers, but also like making it relevant to them. And I think that people comparing people who are living in the metro area versus people who chose to move out to the suburbs. Uh, I, so I'm like my fiance and I are trying to like buy a house right now. And so we're looking in like, you know, the the Minneapolis metro area and 
we've had that discussion about moving to the suburbs and you know a lot of the people that we've talked to who do live out there you know they um I guess they 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 view Minneapolis and the city as you know it, its own kind of I don't want to say an island but like kind of the problem stayed there and they moved to they the wish. <laughs> right, right, right. Really. But that's, that was the mindset that oh that's Minneapolis's problem I you know work there on you know you know on the weekdays or whatever but I chose to live in the suburbs for you know X reason like if there's a report of you know, carjackings and things like that they point to, oh, that's why I chose to live in the suburbs. So it's it's really that disconnect between, you know, people who who live away, who chose to live away, but but working here. It's just, I don't know. I don't know how to bridge that. I do see that being an issue. Um, people talk a lot about the, the transit. I take the transit to school when we had classes. And, um, you know, the... the mental health crises that I've seen on the the transit it it's frustrating because there's there's not a lot that I can do as a student Mm -hmm. Um, I can report that but it just doesn't seem like it's it anything is getting done and it's actually getting more frequent Um, I've been here for three years now or almost three years and it's it seems like it's it's Um, pretty you you just mentioned something that's sparking something in my head that I wonder if the public health advisory board would have any voice in this your con- your comment about people who come into the city and go and it, i remember i i was born in minneapolis and then um grew up in suburbs of a couple different cities and then have um been in, back in minneapolis for the last 24 years in northeast and i i know there was an era and i think it was the palenti administration who said police officers do not need to be residents of the city of minneapolis and I think that was a real problem, right? And the, the, the rationale was, well, we can't attract qualified people. Well, now we have people who aren't a part of the community here, who you know come in from wherever and police and then leave again. And we used to have a police officer on our block the first five years we were here. He was wonderful. You know, he was at our neighborhood night out, the people knew him. And I feel like that person would probably be more in tuned to kind of the vibe of what's going on in the city than someone who's driving home to wherever, fill in the blank, Monticello or whatever. And I don't know, is there any data or any evidence, Margaret, do you know on other cities? Because there are lots of cities that have that requirement that you need to, for certain positions, need to be a resident of the city. Is there any data that says that is a positive thing or is it neutral? Because that is something I would love as a resident of Minneapolis to push for again. Mm. Yeah, I don't have any data at my fingertips, but, you know, we have an Office of Violence Prevention. And, you know, I, I would be surprised if they didn't have their fingers on the pulse of what cities have tried different things and what has felt very successful, you know, for them. So I can certainly ask. I'm just curious. I, it's, I'm sure it's obviously a very, it would be a very hot issue, but. I mean, I don't know. I think that's part of it, right? Is when you create an us them mentality by even, you know, people swooping in and going out, right? And Mm -hmm. holding their nose to go to work in Minneapolis, you know, um, which I've had conversations too with people I know. uh, One person in particular um, who's vaguely related to me, I I won't even say she's a friend, works as a union concrete layer for the city of Minneapolis, lives 60 miles out, and, you know, can't stand coming into the city to do her job and i'm like but then why are you here that's my tax dollars paying your salary missy i just want to mm-hmm. smack her smack her up literally not literally metaphorically and say come <laughs> on you know like you 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 and she's bad mouth in the city and this and that and it's like you don't live there you now she is right. going up to rural isanti and telling stories about what goes on in minneapolis mm-hmm. based on what she sees putting concrete in sidewalks and spending her money in that community you know and that's i mean there's all kinds of issues around that you know is that it's like the 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 earnings you know don't stay in minneapolis either you know is that the the money gets spent you know in some Mm -hmm. you know rural county not to say that they don't deserve to have money spent there but you know it's, it's a, a compounding, snowballing compounding, thing. Compounding, yeah. I was just focusing more on the fact that she's just 
has a lot of misperceptions about what goes on here based on I don't know what kind of evidence and that's what she's spreading back up on Isanti. It's just for per, you know further perpetuates any kind of uh, divide about resources and who should have what. But anyway, I, that was just a curious question about whether public health advisory has any opinion on that or if it's even our purview. I, I, I mean, if the city of Minneapolis doesn't have data on that, I'm sure there's data on that nationally because that's been a topic mm -hmm. uh, in police reform, as I'm sure you know, community policing. Mm -hmm. There have been cities that, I, I can't think of any that come to mind, but I know there have been cities that went back to that requirement that the um, officers live in the city, but I, I don't I don't know the results, but I know that some have tried it. And if you want to cr create a more diverse workforce, let's pull from the people that are here, right? And have um, training and mechanisms in place. There was just a thing on NPR this morning about how in Chicago, the percentage of um, black firefighters is at almost an all time low. You know, and it's this vicious cycle of these people don't see black firefighters. So children in that community don't see themselves as see that as a career. You know, at one time, I forget how big their force is, but they said at one time there was a thousand people, um, uh, black people on the Chicago firefighting and now it's down to 300. Um, so it's been, a you know, two thirds of a drop. And um, then they wonder why, oh, how come we're not getting anybody applying that looks different from the mainstream? Well, the kids don't see themselves in that job. Well, I, I can I steal that away. Um, I live in I live in the Minneapolis. I've been living here since 1997. So I'm talking about like in high school, creating mm -hmm. those uh, opportunity to show kid to showcase or to shadow. There's not a lot of that. Yeah. Um, there's no council talking about options of what you want to be. Um, I didn't get even chance to even hear what other things are available, scholarships. Those, I think it starts from there, like mm -hmm. creating those opportunity for um, kids to explore other options because there's not. I, I've been there in Roosevelt High School. Um, nobody talked about like what scholarship is available, school you want to go to. Um, based off my background, because I am an immigrant who came here, uh, assuming that I don't know a lot because my language will be my barrier, which it is. But I think that was an assumption made mm -hmm. right away. So you have those inner cities education systems and not doing those. Um, currently, because of my workplace, are doing a education pipelines, educating your staff. If they're interested, make those available, uh, provide scholarships. If anybody wanted to become a teacher, uh, special ed, special education, and the schools are providing in those areas. Those are, those are the ones that, we need to look at because when you want inner uh, members or authorities that needs to be in the community, we need to uplift those mm -hmm. because they're not giving the chance to talk about what areas of qualities are not uh, equity in, in the health area. So, because I have a family member uh, who is a mental health uh, adult of learnables, sometimes I worry because. Um, I don't see a lot of people that he come across who would understand his cultural needs and for being different immigrants, things like that. Mm -hmm. And those, yeah. And that's all tied to mental health, right? That Correct. having hope, seeing yourself fitting into a community, right? Seeing yourself having a meaningful role and a place in this world wherever it is right that right. that's all directly connected to uh, you know the the social environment um and and mental health and and we don't have like you said those i want to use the word pipelines but we don't have those avenues in for a lot of people to see themselves um doing those things there weren't no Margaret, what was the actual tasks that we were supposed to discuss on the, uh, on the agenda? Was there, I know there were some bullets there, but I don't remember what they. Mm. I think right. I, I, didn't get, I didn't get any email, so I don't know what are those bullet points we're looking at. Hmm. Did we send email? Yeah, I sent out an agenda. 
and a meeting reminder, and then it had attachments to it. Can you send me that again? I sure. I have this work email. It things gets lost in there. I know. I remember when uh, Cindy Hillier first came on the committee. Yeah. It took us quite a while to figure out why she wasn't getting um, <laughs> emails from us, and yeah. it was, you know, our system security. You know, their yeah. system security Exter not external playing well together. Like yeah. right. external yeah. person is not allowed to access sometimes, so it's it's just hard. Swad, one of the things that I learned about um, uh, trying to break through some of the system security is that if you actually add me in your contacts, and if you had Hattie in your contacts, then when we email you, for whatever reason, because we're sort of an approved contact, yeah. it increases the chances that you actually get the email. The other thing that I could do is, um, because I know that Cindy is able to receive the emails, I could CC her uh, you know, like on a couple of them and see if that helps you get them because I've emailed with her so often. So, I mean, there's at least a couple things we could try, but I will send it to you um, right now and see if it comes through. Of course, now I have to find it. So our, um, I think I sent out the document that said what uh, everything like in this, you know, breakout group. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, and so while I look for that email to send to Swad, you could maybe name off some of those things if you're looking so at it, Tyrion. So the were climate, or, yeah, Tyrion. Yeah. Climate change, air quality, safety, like speed limits, bike safety, domestic violence, mental health, which is what we've been kind of focusing on, the, the lack of mental health service providers, lack of culturally, culturally competent mental health service providers, sexual exploitation prevention, public safety. I, I was thinking there was something else, though, that we were like, we were supposed to take this one step farther, like tonight, that was, was I just making that up, Margaret? <laughs> Maybe we... Maybe that wouldn't exist. No, you're not making it up. Um, okay, so what I'm sending it right now. It does have some attachments, so that might be part of the issue. And see if like in a couple of minutes, if it comes through. Um, I think one of the things that we ultimately want to talk about is, you know, we've got these big topic areas right underneath this mm -hmm. is there something is there some prioritization that we could do as a subgroup amongst these topic areas to say well these two things are linked so we could work on those two things you know kind of at the same time this one is kind of a standalone you know uh topic area um where do we rank those things, you know, and and then we would be able to uh, provide maybe a little bit of direction of where these conversations go. I think because we've spent so little time in uninterrupted conversation about our topic area, we've we've just been sort of letting the conversations flow freely to see what bubbles to the top. So if that's helpful information so yeah Aaron, it, go ahead. yeah that is helpful it's hard to really even pinpoint you know of, of all the things that we've discussed you know how to boil that down to actionable items mm -hmm. right well one of the things that <clears throat> is an actionable item even just out of this conversation tonight is what does the committee need to know about the mental health landscape mm -hmm. in Minneapolis that would help us see our potential role in recommending a change, in supporting a change? Because it's not that we always have to come up with the recommendation. Maybe there right. are groups like yours, Terri Ann, like in the Minneapolis Public Schools that are working on these things 
and already have kind of a plan or a recommendation or um, you know, a something that they want amplified, could we help amplify that message? Could we um, find out more from people that are working in these specific areas? And so with that in mind, then who do you know? Mm-hmm. You know, like what organization could provide a presentation? Could we host a panel discussion about mental health in Minneapolis? And would we have somebody from, say, school-based clinics? Because, you know, Minneapolis Health Department has seven school-based clinics that offer mental health. Would it be helpful to have, you know, a mental health provider in the school-based clinics be one of the presenters? And then are there other presenters that, um, you know, talking about the cultural um, lack of cultural access for uh, Mm -hmm. mental health providers. Um, You know, who could we talk to about that and see if we couldn't come up with three or four names and invite them to be Mm -hmm. part of a panel discussion so that the committee itself could become educated about the topic area and then, you know, maybe discover a place that we Mm -hmm. fit. I like that idea because I feel like yeah, oh, very. I feel like within like the public health department, there's got to be stuff that they're working on around mental health that we don't really know about. Like, and what could we throw our voice behind or what could we help move forward? You know, um, but you're right. We don't, I don't even know what's going on. If you were to ask me, you know, what is the city of Minneapolis doing to address the, you know, mental health crisis, even just that broad of a term, I, I would say, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I really don't know right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. And part of it is that, um, you know, it's tricky because, you know, mental health services per se, mm-hmm. you know, really fall under human services, which falls under right, Hennepin right. County, you know, which right, is why right. we had, you know, Meredith come with her mm-hmm. colleague, you know, to kind of talk about the scope of mental health mm-hmm. services that are being provided there. But I think, you know, we're really kind of narrowing in on some really critical things, you know, which are, yeah, lack of access, um, lack of um, available uh, people, you know, even to do the job. Um, Mm -hmm. But then those people who are qualified are being locked out because of this certification process. And um, and then you have the whole, um, uh, you know, issue about how do I find a mental health provider who looks like me, who speaks my language, right. who understands my trauma, who, you know, really is someone that I can trust to get adequate mental health care from mm-hmm. as opposed to, you know, leaving it up to, you know, the dominant culture, you know, to provide the services right in (laughs) inappropriately, you know. Mm -hmm. So I guess I could I could at least propose, you know, a couple of those ideas in terms of school based clinics, um, Mm -hmm. you know, talking about the mental health services that they're providing to students specifically. And then um, the Community Health Improvement Partnership of Hennepin County funded. Yeah, I'd like to more just know more about that. Yeah, you know, funded um, because we had received a grant, funded um, the Annex Teen Clinic, who just did an amazing project on mental health and um, healthcare advocacy with a youth advisory council. Mm -hmm. So they would be a great group to come and talk about what they learned, you know, through their process of doing this project and what kind of deliverables, you know, they Mm -hmm. came up with because the students themselves, and these are not like high school students. These are age, I think they were 19 to 22. So college students, um, that came up with the messaging 
uh, created this flip card that has resources on mental health, um, mental health resources, and then tips on uh, like trauma, like what is trauma informed care? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you advocate for yourself? Um, you know, what are what are those things that you know? And and this can be folded up and just like stuck in your cell phone, you know, mm -hmm. pocket, you know, in your wallet, um, so that you have it available. They also created a 20 minute video on why is trauma informed care and and mental health care um, mm -hmm. necessary, you know, critical um, and and then especially to have those two combined, you mm -hmm. know, trauma informed mental health care. Is this an actual you said the name of the clinic is the Annex Teen Clinic. Mm -hmm. This is so good because I have students right now, doctoral students who are I have a lot of people that want to work with young, young adults and mental health for their capstone. And um, I'm going to look into this as a suggestion for them, mm -hmm. some, some of them to look into this organization. And I can connect you. <laughs> oh, that would be great. Because <laughs> that, that's what I do. Um, so, you know, that would at least be like two audiences, mm -hmm. you know, that, and then um, I attended a, um, it was a mental health conference that had primarily mental health providers of color and culture and language mm -hmm. um, who were doing various presentations uh, at this conference. And so I could find out what that organization was called. I don't for some reason, I don't receive their emails anymore, but I used to be on like their email list and I would find out about these trainings, you know, that they would be doing or these was workshops. It, it wasn't from Wilder, was it? No. Mm -mm. I know Wilder is a, you know, a wonderful community based example. They, they employ a lot of professionals of color in various yes. um, backgrounds. And obviously they're primarily serving St. Paul and things eastward, but. Mm hmm. Yeah, but, you know, so so that would be, I, I think, kind of a concrete idea that we could bring back to the group is we need to learn more because we're narrowing in on kind of a focus of mm -hmm. access. Um, and that's, you know, health, mental right. health access, as well as cultural language, mm -hmm. color access. And we'd like to propose that we have a panel discussion, you know, yeah. that we could host and um, we could come up with the questions that we would like, you know, the panelists to address, you know, in telling their story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that we have a couple of ideas of, you know, people mm -hmm. that we could invite. Yeah, I, I like that. Thank you for I, shaping our thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that as well. That's that's a great suggestion and it's actionable. So mm -hmm. we can, can work on. Yeah, and it's informative because we don't really know where PHAC fits, you know, in right. this landscape. And so let's learn more about the landscape and then we might be able to see ourselves in it. I think we're gonna get yanked back here any minute. All right. I, I could be wrong, but I feel like that's true. I think they said 750, yeah. Yeah. So I am going to stop recording